everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. From wherever you're joining us, a warm welcome to you. My name is Jane Cohen. I'm a senior analyst here at the International Energy Agency, working on our people-centered and inclusive clean energy transitions team. The topic of today's webinar is really, really central to how we are seeing our work here at the IEA. We talk a lot about the clean energy transition and all of the opportunities and benefits that will be provided for people. But really, unless clean energy is affordable and accessible for everybody, regardless of their income, we really have failed as policymakers. But policy design can be quite complex and we don't always get the outcomes that we're looking for. And as a former policymaker myself, I know really how hard it can be to design clean energy programs in ways that are accessible and affordable for everyone. To support our work on this at the IEA, we are doing really targeted work on affordability. And just a plug out there, for, for folks, I know there's a lot of expertise. If you have data on this that you think would be interesting, if you have case studies, if you have thoughts on, on how you think we should be looking at this, please don't hesitate to share it with us. For us, really looking at affordability, again, is very, very central to how we are putting forward our work on an inclusive, fair, and people-centered clean energy transition. So really kind of kicking off this work um, at this stage for us is this workshop today on bridging the gap for inclusive uh, transitions, clean energy programs for low income households. I'm very excited now to listen and to learn from our four experts who all have really deep policy knowledge on designing these kinds of programs for low income communities. So we have a speaker from Ireland, we have one from the United States, we have one from Mexico and one from Canada. So I'm hoping and I'm, and I'm looking forward to really getting a sense of how different programs targeted for different kinds of communities have been effective, what kinds of challenges people have encountered while trying to implement these programs, how, how policymakers have really gotten the support that they need for these kinds of programs and what the outcomes have been. So, we're going to start with Connor Hanafi. Connor is currently the Energy Poverty Program Manager at the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. He's been there for over 16 years, so definitely comes with a lot of experience. Uh, he previously worked as a program manager of the Deep Retrofit Pilot Program, and before that as the program manager for building energy rating and accelerated capital allowance programs. So obviously uh, a lot to share from his many years of experience. Um, so Connor, please go ahead and just tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing. Yeah, so <clears throat> thanks for the invitation to the uh, workshop and I'm delighted to be participating and to listen to other uh, thoughts as well. So I'm working with the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland um, and we're, we're funded by the Department of Environment Climate Action climate and communications um, and SEI, the Sustainable Energy Authority, focus on uh, the three primary areas, citizens and communities, business, public and transport, research and policy and insights. And uh, my particular role currently is focused on the energy poverty program. Um, so within our national retrofit directorate, we provide a suite of programs um, to address all uh, housing retrofit needs. So that includes uh, individual measures and one-stop shop services and the uh, funded, fully funded energy upgrade uh, program, which is the focus of, of this event. And, uh, and so I have been involved considerably with the design of these programs and forming on policy. Um, and that's, uh, I, I suppose what, I, what I'd say is that uh, our programs have evolved over time and uh, have involved through wide uh, engagement with all stakeholders, including uh, those we're, we're, we're impacting through our, our grant program. So 
so while we have a suite of programs, they each have a specific focus. And uh, um, yeah, now that they're the programs that uh, I'm happy to talk about today. Connor, I'm going to go a little off script here. Um, can you can you give us a little more context? I mean, what when you think about energy poverty in Ireland, I mean, can you just kind of explain what the context for that is, sort of what percentage of the population um, is in would be considered in energy poverty, and um, sort of what the approaches have been for addressing that? Yeah, there's. I suppose it, it's. Uh... I can cover that as we go through this. There are uh, there is work through our Energy Poverty Action Plan, which uh, encompasses a number of strands of how uh, energy poverty is 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 dealt with, um, and that covers meeting the cost of energy, the energy efficiency, research and governance, and, and communications. So um, what I would say is that you know, we have some research uh, carried out that would show you know potentially 25 percent of people in this and that's quite but again i think there have been a number of influences over the last number of years and it probably draws out the dynamic nature of this with regard to the geopolitical situation and the impact on on fuel prices um so in ireland um we we've most uh of the program that supported supports uh, people in receipt of uh fuel allowance so the to our department of social protection there is a particular funding provided uh, to applicants um which is means tested and um they receive a, a payment and on foot of that payment then they also attract the energy efficiency measures so it would range from uh, fuel allowance to job seekers allowance uh, working family payments one parent pa family payment, domiciliary care allowance, disability allowance. And th this has been evolved over time. Um, but what I would say is that the, the fully funded energy uh, program, the energy poverty program is, is primarily, uh, or, or at least the applications we receive is primarily related to fuel allowance and supporting those most in need. Well, this actually goes into my question for you, because I saw that you recently, well, your your team recently put out a report, Healthy Homes Ireland. And in that, there's a, a real focus on the need for various agencies to be coordinated. And just in that list of, of the different approaches to energy poverty, I mean, you can already, I mean, I'm just imagining all the different agencies that, that could be part of that. Um, you know, it, this is such a cross-cutting issue. It's not surprising that it involves, you know, multiple different uh, different agencies. But I'm wondering, from your perspective, if you can talk about why that coordination is is so important and what some of the challenges in achieving it are. Yeah, sure. So, like we we would engage quite broadly with various stakeholders. Uh, yeah, in the Healthy Homes Ireland initiative, which was led by the Irish Green Building Council. It encompasses, encompassed a number of stakeholders and uh, quite broad from regulatory policy, uh, indoor air quality, uh, you know, the um, training in colleges and universities. And I suppose, I suppose what we see and the importance of establishing synergies. So essentially, we're, we're trying to pre present a value proposition to those most in need. And uh, what we see is through our broad engagement is that each entity is providing something quite particular to the applicant and uh, in this particular um, review around healthy homes it, it was to join the dots really between uh, the insights from from the university regulation uh, uh, relative to uh, ventilation in, in retrofit um, and the importance of sharing awareness, educating and upskilling. So we also see the supply chain playing a key part in this, in that there are many players and many actors that will influence um, our customers. And it's to have that joined up dot thinking with regard to the offering. Um, occupant empowerment. So those living in the homes, do, are, do they know how to use the technology? Do they know the importance of indoor air quality? Um, and, and 
obviously the the, the knowledge um across all actors um is very important um regulation obviously plays a key a key role and and then without funding um it, it you know it, it doesn't happen and uh, i think uh, there's funding particularly for those most vulnerable um but I, what i'd say is that i think leadership across all the entities and joined up thinking are very important to join the dots uh, on the synergies and present them in a very simple way to people Thank you, Connor. And I, I think this, I think this question of how to align and coordinate interventions that can have multiple uh, positive benefits. For example, housing interventions that can um, that can tackle energy efficiency, lead remediation, and abatement, asthma triggers, et cetera, mold. Um, you know, that's something that that is something that I know a lot of policymakers are thinking about. And so, you know, I would also just ask others on the, on the, uh, uh, on the panel to, to talk about that if they, if they would like. Um, now I'm going to go over to uh, Catherine Klinger. Catherine is currently the executive director of the New Jersey governor's office of climate action and the green economy, where she manages the governor's portfolio on climate, energy, and environment. And as part of that, she also leads the policy on all of the low income, uh, low income programs. Um, before that, she was uh, a longtime uh, worker at the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, where she worked on interventions around uh, housing, clean energy, and other uh, health and safety issues in the home. So Catherine, um, if you could talk a little bit about the work that you're doing and um, specifically kind of how you think about it in terms of access and affordability for clean energy uh, for, uh, for low income households. Absolutely, Jane, it's my pleasure to do so. And thank you to IEA and to you for convening this important discussion today. Um, so as you mentioned, um, I head up the uh, work of the Office of, of Climate Action and the Green Economy in Governor Murphy's um, office. And I think it's maybe uh, helpful to set just a bit of context about the work that we do um, in what we call the O-Cage uh, in Governor Murphy's office. And so, you know, as folks are familiar with at the federal level for the first time in the United States, we're seeing, um, you know, really focused investment and, and policy around climate action. Uh, but for a long time, uh, prior to even what we're seeing at the federal level of the United States right now, Governor Murphy has been deeply engaged in setting a bold climate action agenda for New Jersey. And so part of that is really doing a lot of the underlying planning and analysis to understand what are the sector specific emissions reductions and clean energy deployment targets that New Jersey needs to meet in order to make an impact um, on the climate crisis. We're a coastal state. And so many of our frontline communities in New Jersey are not only on the front lines of the impacts of, of the climate crisis, but also literally on the front lines for impacts like flooding um, and other types of, uh, of impacts of severe weather. And so we think a lot about sort of the, the broad approach to, uh, to equitable clean energy deployment and climate action in New Jersey. And that includes not just the actions that we're taking in our housing sector to reduce emissions, but also building out uh, diverse and inclusive opportunities in the growing green economy in our state um, and, and ensuring that those opportunities accrue to residents of our frontline communities. Um, so just a couple of examples, and, and Jane, you sort of flagged some of this um, in your intro, but we are seeking to achieve an 89% emissions reduction in the housing sector in New Jersey. And so what that means is really rapid and widespread deployment of cleaner and greener technology in buildings, particularly in residential buildings in the state. However, we also are in the midst of a deep housing affordability crisis and housing quality crisis in New Jersey. Much of our housing is very old. Much of it is renter occupied. About a third of it is renter occupied. And this housing not only is in need of a transition away from fossil fuel uh, building heating systems, but also in deep need of repairs in order to improve, as Connor was saying, indoor air quality, um, to remediate hazards like lead and to make an impact on the downstream health effects of poor housing quality. 
Um, and also to make that housing more efficient in order to bring down energy costs for families um, that are living there. And so we've uh, strived to take a holistic approach to that emissions reduction work in buildings. Um, and again, we've done a great deal of planning and analysis about how to achieve that and are sort of in the beginning of the implementation phase now in New Jersey, but programs like Comfort Partners, um, which is an initiative that is uh, co-run uh, by our large energy utilities and our uh, government, our board of public utilities in the state, um, really seeks to uh, identify housing that's in deep need of these sort of retrofits and repairs and kind of do a one-stop shop to that, uh, to, to meeting all of those housing needs holistically. Um, so doing energy efficiency work that improves the envelope at the same time that we're installing high efficiency heat pumps at the same time that we're remediating lead and improving ventilation um, to improve indoor air quality. So, you know, we um, we see this sort of deep intensive investment intensive approach to addressing the issues in our housing stock as sort of core to our um, equitable approach to to a transition um, to cleaner and greener solutions. And I'll just give one more example, if I may, which is kind of on more on the clean energy deployment side, which is our community solar program. So folks may be familiar with this model, um, but this is a, a model where uh, solar developers are encouraged to build large scale solar on previously unused or municipally owned land, and then to um, to deploy that energy or, or uh, allow that energy to be distributed to um, low to moderate income households who can benefit from cleaner and greener technologies and reductions on their on their um, energy costs. And so this community solar model really removes the upfront barriers of having to have access and upfront capital to be able to install rooftop solar for low to moderate income households in New Jersey and allows folks to take advantage of that clean energy um, sort of without those upfront, uh, upfront costs. Um, we're iterating on this program. So we've recently passed legislation that allows for certain census tracts within municipalities to opt out of community solar, meaning that if you live in an overburdened census tract, you will automatically be enrolled. Uh, for participation in the community solar program unless you opt out. Um, so that's just a much more, you know, sort of, again, low barrier, more equitable approach to deploying this um, cleaner and greener technology in our municipalities. And we're, we're working through, again, how we're going to implement that. But there's been tremendous interest in that program and in that model in New Jersey. Thanks, Catherine. I was actually going to ask you, and, and this is, again, something I would appreciate hearing all the panelists' perspectives on. In some of these interventions, like community solar that you mentioned, I mean, how does the word get out about something like that? I mean, I assume, um, you know, people are are perhaps not completely trusting of someone who kind of comes to their door and is pitching them on a program. And, you know, Connor, I was thinking about this as well when you were talking, um, you know, it's not surprising that some of our, you know, low income communities may not have full trust in government programs or, mm. or um, mm. you know, certain schemes that, that they just don't necessarily have a lot of information about. So, Catherine, mm -hmm. I know this isn't the question that I prepared for you, and I'll come back to that, but if you could just kind of talk quickly about in, in a situation like that, and I know you just mentioned that now it's opt out, but before that and with comfort partners, et cetera, what is the mechanism for communicating with, with, with folks about this, and what is the mechanism for kind of trust building around that? Yeah, it's such an important question, Jane, and it has been a significant barrier um, to some of our efforts in New Jersey. I think the answer to that is that oftentimes the messenger cannot be government. It has to be um, aligned and deep partnerships with trusted community-based organizations and um, trusted community partners who can get the word out. And much of the success that we see in these programs is actually by sort of good old-fashioned word of mouth. Uh, where people who have received the services and had a good experience, which is you know critical, right, to building that trust, um, then tell their neighbors and their family members and their friends, and and we sort of see the word uh, get out that way. But I do think those partnerships are central to making sure these types of services are successfully deployed in communities. Thanks for that. And again, you know, if other folks have thoughts on on that question, please feel free to to jump in on that. I I yeah, I'd agree with Catherine. I, I think the, the the trusted advisors and also the leveraging um established instruments in 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 regulation also um lead to trust and trust is something that's built over time so our european performance certificates for example 
uh, adds trust and the actors in that regard of building energy rating assessors. Um, but you need that network on the ground of sustainable energy communities, which SEI provide to um, um, inform uh, local um, local people in the community of the benefits. And I think part of that too is the supply chain. The supply chain plays a large role, uh, particularly when it's local uh, supply chain of trusted um, actors in the community and getting the good news stories out. I think we need to, you know, when we when we, we focus on the works and but the story uh, needs to be told then once the works are done and, and that, that can lead to um, uh, an understandable uh, community that can will engage over time. Yeah. Thanks, Connor and Liliana. I see you. Uh, I see you nodding your head there. So I'm actually gonna gonna skip right over to you. Um, so let me do a quick intro, and then if you want to answer, if you want to jump in on that question, and then we can go back. Um, that would be great. So um, I'm very happy to uh, be joined today by Liliana Campos Ariaga. Um, she's the Director of Projects for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at GIZ in Mexico. She's worked on energy efficiency in buildings and particularly focused on refurbishing social housing across a number of countries with various partners and recently concluded a project on energy efficiency rehabilitation of social housing in Mexico. Um, so I know also, Liliana, your experience is not just um, in Mexico, but you've had experience with this kind of in, in multiple uh, multiple different contexts. Um, but I would be very curious to hear kind of your thoughts on this question of communicating programs uh, to the targeted uh, communities and households, and then we'll, we'll get back to our uh, regularly scheduled programming. Yes, thank you, Jane and, and the agency for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. And I actually was nodding on Catherine's intervention because this mouth-to-mouth, uh, -mouth, uh, word -to word uh, spreading the news is something that we detected as well to be like um, a winning point or a turnaround for engaging the people in getting renovating their homes. So uh, yes, and, and also you also touched the thing about how are you going to be opening your door to a person that is going to be uh, telling you about the solar community program? Um, in Mexico, this is particularly a concern with the security issue, no? so who is knocking on my door and talking about uh, energy efficiency? So um, I would just like to say that, um, well, GIZ has a long story of collaboration with Mexico promoting sustainable energy and social housing. So back in 2010, GIZ provided technical support for designing the first sustainable housing NAMA. Um, later in 2012, along with IDB, uh, we provided technical support for its implementation. So this sustainable NAMA uh, was focusing on new construction, so social housing, uh, new construction that was mainly designed, um, constructed and commercialized by developers. Um, and perhaps I, I here would like to highlight the two main ways that we have of producing social housing in Mexico. So the first way is the commercial production of social housing, where the end user basically just go to the market and see what a housing is available, but the developer um, decides uh, the land, the location, the orientation, the design, the building materials, and so on. The second way of producing is that that's what we call self-produced house, where the end user, or the people that will actually be living on the spaces, they decide on the land, on the location, on the building materials, the design, and also the time, the time frame of the construction and the financing means. So um, they may or may not be involved in some type of the construction th themselves. So um, most of the financial and technical cooperation program have been designed targeting the commercial uh, way of production of the social housing. And for those joining us from other countries, I would like to clarify that when we are talking about social housing in Mexico, we are referring to houses that are around 55 to 80 square meters, and they're around in an average cost of $60,000. So this is the kind of houses that we are talking about. And building upon the experiences of um, these new housing or new construction programs, in 2018, the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ, commissioned commission GIZ to support the Mexican government with the implementation of these 
uh, refurbishment um, of social housing program, the DKTI VES or DKTI Vivienda, as, as we call it in short. So this uh, program, the DKTI Vivienda, closed in September last year and was targeting existing homes. So existing homes is a home that is people actually occupying <laughs> the spaces in a regular manner. So therefore, any intervention to improve energy efficiency or quality of life or indoor air conditions, as Connor said, should be thoroughly co-created with them. They are going to be deciding what is going to be happening on their spaces. So basically the question was, how to better support these families to make informed decisions, to renovate their houses in a way that their needs are satisfi satisfied, but at the same time, they can save energy and improve the long-term living conditions. So how do you do that? And raising awareness, and this is the, the touching back to the communication aspect, was um, was key, you know, uh, making information re regarding energy efficiency solutions and biochemical designs available for the end user was uh, key. And I am very proud to say the Mexican government is very clear on the importance of putting people at the center of the clean energy transitions. So as a response, the Secretary of Agrarian Land and Urban Development, uh, Sedatu, um, with GIZ support, launched the web portal, Decide y Construye. So I will put the link on the chat later, but this uh, Decide y Construye is hosting information for the end user, but information that would answer critical questions. So uh, where do I find technical assistance to build my house? Where can I find the right construction materials for me? What can I do if I am too cold or too hot in my house? Um, what financing right. options do I have? And additionally, um, we spread this content over the social media, um, YouTube and Facebook mainly. So the last report that I have is that around 30.5 million people have been interacting with the content in all of these three platforms since 2021 when it was launched. So this is something that really um, makes sense for them. So finding the answers to common questions. Let me just ask you a follow up on that. I mean, I think web communication and, and a portal on the one hand seems like a great way to reach a lot of people, but on the other hand, if you don't know about it or you don't have easy access to something like that, it can also be a challenge. So how, just even taking a step further back, you know, how are, how is that being communicated to people and how do people kind of take that first step towards, towards even knowing that this is an option? It's just what Catherine said, it's mouth to mouth. So we, we, with the help with extensionists and people like uh, Habitat for Humanity that are really on the ground in the territory, they started spreading the word. And of course we coupled that with uh, um, physical uh, in-ground uh, workshops to make available this um, information. And the, the great thing is that mostly everyone um, has now a, a smartphone on their hands. So this is a quite a, a, a good way to spread the word and then have the information actually in your hand. Thank you. Um, and there's a lot that I'd like to follow up there, but for right now, I'm gonna go to our fourth and, uh, and final speaker, um, Jean-Clement Chaunier. Jean-Clement has been working at the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources of Canada for almost 10 years. Today, he is the Executive Director for Information Management and Technology, Information Te Technology, Policy and Programs, and was previously Director General for Portfolio Management and Corporate Secretariat and Director of Digital Communications. Now, I know, um, Jean Clement, you're going to talk about the the oil to heat pump program, um, and I think it would be great if you can just tell us about the work that you've been doing and and what that program is. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today uh, with my other colleagues from around the globe. Um, so I'm here also today as the executive director for the Green Homes Division, uh, which delivers these programs to Canadians. Um, so great conversation so far. Um, the oil to heat pump program uh, in, 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 in relationship to this conversation is aimed at Canadians who are basically heating their home with oil 
and are at low to median income. Uh, so, 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 so the thinking here is we're targeting homeowners who are most vulnerable. He, all heated homes, uh, all heating is the most polluting. It's also the most expensive and the most unpredictable form of heating that we have here in terms of actual heating costs. Canada is a gold country. It is critical for us to provide Canadians with any, with, with with affordable energy. Uh, and, 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 and home heating, space heating, accounts for about 98% of the greenhouse gas emissions from the resi residential sector. So decarbonizing home heating is critical for us in our objectives to meet our climate change goals. Uh, the oil to heat bulb program actually came about quite rapidly. Uh, it was announced in the federal government's fall economic statement in 2022, so November 2022. It was pre-launched within three months and officially launched on April 1st, 2023. Uh, it is delivered uh, either by the federal government or in collaboration with our provincial governments. So, so, so provincial governments uh, actually some of them already had similar types of programming already in play mm -hmm. uh, in certain provinces. And the principle at play is that for citizens, it doesn't make sense to have to knock on different levels of governments to get funding. Uh, so so the, it's a one, one door approach, one stop to get all government funding, whether it's provincial or federal, that's the principle. And that's in order to make it easier for Canadians to access funding. Um, the program in, in 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 the vast majority of cases is fully digitally delivered and 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 the, the principle is that um it is aimed at replacing oil fired heating with an energy efficient electric heat pump which basically reduces greenhouse gas, gas emissions provides predictability and reduces the cost of heating people's homes uh, we do means tested so every participant is means tested uh, we 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 verify that they are at low and median income, and um, it's front loaded because one of the major uh, obstacles in heat pump production is the upfront capital cost. So so in order to address that issue, we provide uh, the subsidy to Canadian homeowners it, ahead of the heat pump installation, and then we will verify that said work has been accomplished. So, so uh, in terms of the national delivery mechanism, getting homeowners apply online, provide the information, provide us with a quote, so on and so forth. And then within 48 hours, typically they will be, if they meet all the criteria approved for the subsidy and will be mailed a check with the amount. Um, now in areas where the federal government provides the program, we provide a subsidy of about 10,000 Canadian dollars uh, to Canadian homeowners, we have estimated the average cost of a transition from oil to heat pump at 18400 so a significant amount. In areas and provinces where we co-deliver with our provincial colleagues, the federal government increases uh, the federal funding per household to up to 15000 Canadian dollars, provided the province also puts in an additional $5,000. So in those areas of the country, we are actually in the territory of a free oil to heat pump transition. Um, the program aims to transition between 50 to 60,000 Canadian households from oil to heat pump across the country. Um, now, um, uptake has been good so far. So we're seeing a very positive response. So things are working very well. Um, and, uh, so that's, this, this has been, you know, uh, we've, we've, we've been running this for about, you know, almost a year, uh, uptake has been pretty constant, uh, and, and, and we're really focusing also on, 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 on that specific demographic. So these are communities, these are recipients that are more, most vulnerable because they're, you know, not as wealthy. They also face non-financial barriers in many cases. So we're trying to streamline the process as much as possible. We're also trying to find some flexibilities and find some additional ways of delivering the programs. So we're looking at the possibility of doing some, some, some contribution agreements with some third parties who could do turnkey service in certain vulnerable communities, for example. We know that certain demographics 
and then this has been said already, you know, have a lesser trust in government. So maybe if we can find some partners that are local at the community level who are equipped uh, to, to, to do these transitions in a turnkey fashion, but also have a more close, a closer relationships to these communities, we can get better results. Uh, so we're looking at that definitely, and a suite of additional flexibilities. Obviously, the in context, we're also very cognizant that 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 we will also want to make sure that indigenous communities across the country uh, participate in this, and we have also built in this suite of additional flexibilities for these indigenous communities to make certain that you know they can take advantage of these. And in often cases, working with our provincial colleagues is very beneficial because they have a closer relationship to their constituents than we do at the federal level. Um, so, so as as in as an introduction, I guess I would keep it at that. But happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. And I know Catherine has a question for you, and I do too. So I'm going to jump in ahead. Right, I'm going to take my privilege as the moderator and the jump privilege. ahead in line with her and just ask. Um, you mentioned it's means tested, and I'm wondering. You know, we hear a lot about you know, burden of paperwork and having a lot to submit. And that can be, you know, an issue for people accessing these these programs that are targeted for them. But then there's, you know, such a high burden of, of paperwork and kind of proof of things that it actually makes it very difficult. And I'm just wondering, since you said you have a lot of uptake on this program already, you know, is it, what is your method for means testing? Is it simple and, and streamlined? I think that could be interesting for, for those of us who are kind of thinking about this broadly. Absolutely. Uh, we deliver multiple such programs and and and, and in all of our experience, and, and I say jokingly to all my, my friends and colleagues, you know, the three main lessons we've learned for all of these programs is make it simple, make it simpler, and make it more simple, especially for the recipients. Uh, the way that means testing occurs as in the national delivery model, uh, when participants apply online, in Canada, everyone has a nine-digit social insurance number. That, that identifies you as a person. And the Canada, it also identifies you to the Canada Revenue Agency, which is the Canadian taxman. So, so, so when people provide their social insurance number as they register for the program, within four, 24 hours, an automated process that runs late at night will liaise with, will communicate with the Canada Revenue Agency and get the confirmation automatically. There's no human intervention whatsoever. So, so, so again, making it very, simple, making it seamless and transparent for the homeowners who reply. Thank you. Catherine, do you want to jump in with your question? Sure. Thank you so much, Jane. I, you know, I think we've had our eye on um, Canada's model for heat pump deployment, um, specifically because there is a lot of great uptake. And one of the things, you know, certainly the upfront um, uh, capital that defrays the cost of the, the you know, the, the investment in the initial heat pump is very important, but we're in this sort of um, liminal space right now in the U in much of the U.S. where we're waiting for those federal dollars to come down to be able to do the kind of point of sale upfront um, heat pump rebates. Um, and so we're looking for creative solutions to start to deploy heat pumps now. And one of the things that we've heard that Canada is doing is a really simple model for um, financing the cost of the heat pump right on the energy bill. Um, and I was wondering if that's something, it looks like you're nodding your head, so you are familiar with that. And, and if you're, um, if that is being done sort of strictly in the kind of middle income sector of the market, or if you've seen that type of approach work for lower income households as well. Um, again, oil to heat pump is really targeted to low to medium income Canadians. So, so, so again, there, there, is, there are no real third parties in terms of the financing aspects. The federal government uh, provides the funds in the national del delivery. The federal government pays the homeowner directly. In cases where we are co-delivering the program with our provincial colleagues, we provide through a contribution agreement the funding for the entire program delivery to our provincial friends, who then deliver their programs via their own digital means. Um, now, in terms of constituents, homeowners who are not in the low to medium income bracket, we do have additional programming. We have the Green Homes Grant and the Green Homes Loan programs. These are additional programs. Uh, they're not structured the same way. The grant, for example, is aimed at paying about 25% uh, of an energy efficiency retrofit for Canadian homes. 
Uh, it is a, a large program. Uh, we're looking at about you know 500,000 plus people to participate. It also is not specific to heat pump. It includes building envelopes. So heat pumps, windows and doors, uh, insulation, air sealing, and so on and so forth. Uh, the grant can be up to 5,000 Canadian dollars. That's a bit different. We uh, it's 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 really more designed for again the median and upwards uh, bracket of income. We provide the subsidy once we have proof of retrofits completed. It's not upfront. Uh, it is again a fully digital user journey. Uh, but but it's a bit different, right? And in those cases, we also uh, in 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 certain areas of country have provided have partners with utilities in order to deliver the program. So in two provinces, we have a utility that actually operates and operationalizes the program on our, on, on our behalf. So we provide the actual funding for that area of the country to that utility who delivers a program according to our parameters on our behalf. Again, because they have their own program. So we combine everything together. So it's one stop shop uh, for the Canadian homeowner in those areas. Thank you. That's a really interesting program. Um, and I think it's, uh, just encouraging that you've had a lot of uptake, and even though the program is still fairly young. Um, Kate, Catherine, I'm going to go back to you for a minute. You've had a lot of experience, obviously, in New Jersey, but before that, you were working nationally in the United States on these issues. And I'm wondering, having seen a lot of different kinds of programs, you know, what are programs that you've seen that have been really effective? Has there is there something that kind of stands out in your mind where you can say, you know, we did this and then this and then this and that was the formula? Or, you know, do you have anything that that you think is kind of really a shining example of something that's been very successful in terms of kind of targeting and having effective policies for low income families on the clean energy side? Yeah, I think specifically in the housing space and housing energy efficiency space, one of the most successful approaches that we've seen has been to take a health-based approach to this work. And so oftentimes what that looks like is that you are combining um, home health visiting services, um, you know, for example, specifically around asthma um, that, that tackle and address some of the behavioral aspects of that environmental illness at the same time that you're doing structural updates and improvements to the home environment where you are improving the indoor air quality, um, improving the efficiency of the home, and also in doing some of these greener, greener and cleaner technologies. And so it really is sort of a, it's a holistic approach that um, takes a health lens to the housing environment, to the home environment, in order to really, um, I think, you know, again, sort of help to build that trust um, get the foot in the door when you are talking to residents about what needs to happen with their home, and then also allows you to do some measurement of the impact of the work that you're doing from a health perspective. Um, and the advantage of that is that it also helps in some cases to get more healthcare dollars in the door to be able to do these types of interventions. So in an environment like the U.S. where we have, you know, I think fewer sort of government-based um, sources of resources for this types of work, you know, you also need to tap into the healthcare system to uh, be able to show the kind of upstream or downstream impacts of improvements to housing. Um, so that mix of home visiting and a health-based approach to housing improvements, I think we have seen be very successful in, in a variety of different kinds of communities and housing stocks around the country. Yeah, that, that makes me think of what Connor was speaking about at the at the beginning of our panel on kind of the need for this collaboration between various agencies. I mean, thinking about kind of energy interventions and health interventions, and again, sort of the the collaboration that's needed for for those kinds of interventions to be really successful. Uh, Liliana, I'm going to ask you a similar question. I mean, you've worked in a number of different contexts, um, Mexico and other countries, and. Um, you know, curious if there's something that, again, really sticks out in your mind, kind of either in one specific place or across every place that you've worked, something that that policymakers and implementers should really keep in mind as kind of best practices for having effective outcomes. Yes. Um, well, I think the financial aspect and the technical aspect should go hand in hand. And just uh, John Carmen uh, just said something about subsidies for the upcoming front uh, cost of the of the heat pumps. And, and in our experience, the subsidies are always um, something that can get the wheel moving, but then you have to have a solid and strong mechanism when they are 
withdraw, no? So that the program can keep and, and keep moving and, and keep existing. And we depended on the on the subsidies for uh, improving uh, sustainability in social housing. And, and, and this is something that we are uh, currently uh, transiting towards just doing it in a, in a voluntary manner uh, and not depending on the subsidies. But it is um, also well uh, through that you need that for starting, no? for starting uh, making the wheel. Um, the other thing I would like to say is that, um, uh, uh, and you touched that on energy poverty, no? Uh, basically is, is uh, be aware when designing the policy package of the, um, of the income capacity, uh, uh, of the credit capacity of the people that you are going to be uh, targeting. Uh, sometimes the technological solutions are designed for achieving the maximum um, greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction. But then again, the cost of implementing that at a, a mass scale might not be uh, quite related with that um, outcome. So bear in mind that uh, and, and better is, um, be to uh, step by step than trying to do something very ambitious that is only going to be uh, affecting a few people that can afford the solution. That's helpful. And I think that kind of goes to this question of making policy that is actually implementable on the ground. And, and again, why it's so important that, you know, there are a lot of open channels with community groups and others who can help give that feedback of what's actually plausible, what's actually workable and, and what's not. I want to ask our panelists now, when we talk about the clean energy transition and we talk about the potential for job growth and, and bringing a, a diverse workforce and new opportunities, we're often talking about the same kinds of populations or sometimes the same kinds of populations who we would be targeting for some of these uh, uh, clean energy affordability interventions. And so I'm just wondering when you're thinking about, let's say energy efficiency or you know heat pump installation, you're thinking about um, you know, solar panel installation. Do your programs or how are you thinking about kind of workforce and, and developing a local community-based workforce as part of that? Has that been part of your programs? Is there interest in that? I think it would be really helpful to kind of hear what some of your experiences with that have been. So, uh, Connor, over to you um, yeah, to, sure. uh, to speak yeah, so to that. So I suppose Ireland's main um, energy poverty program is the Warmer Homes program. It's fully funded um and it prioritizes the worst performing homes the f and g um on the on the building energy rating scales of the worst performing and the oldest homes and obviously the most vulnerable so it's it's fully funded and we've seen um uh, considerable success on the program over the last number of years so pre covid um re last year's expenditure relative to pre covid is it's tripled in in capital expenditure with 157 million. Now, what I would say is that obviously there's been a number of benefactors from this, and uh, obviously the, the alleviation of energy poverty is focus of the program through energy efficiency. That's been hugely su successful. Um, related to Catherine and, and John, John's point, um, this is delivered by SAI um, through a contractor panel. So, uh, so this. Uh, and there's been an established panel over a number of years, and our our um, movement over the last number of years has been to broaden that panel um, because it is free. Um, we pay for it, and it's funded by the Department uh, of, the, of the Environment on this, and uh, that has allowed the supply chain to grow. Um, and I think one one key point about this is, um, you know, a flow of work. Um, reliable, predictable. So the benefactors are seeing this. And once we once you get a program to flow, you, you can turn the dials on, on the design, et cetera. But it must be it must um, provide um, a flow and back to the trust point that leads to trust and uh, supply chain engagement, uh, which ultimately leads to the objectives being achieved, which is uh, alleviation of uh, fuel poverty. And uh, and I suppose there's an ongoing process on the supply chains development of uh, skills and capacity. But I think once they see it dependable and reliable and vision of it into the future, they will invest in it. 
um, and and then it's telling that story afterwards because it's 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 as well as the recipient of this works. It was a very powerful human story to this. There are also the supply chain had all an equally uh, powerful uh, human story um, in, in the local context. So yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think the, the the importance of of investment and this reliable um, delivery uh, is very important to growth. Yeah, and just to say, I mean, I think I really agree that there is this very powerful human component here. Um, and when we can, as you put it, kind of turn the dials on the program design. Um, and I think that's kind of the gold standard is having a program that delivers, you know, clean, affordable, accessible, clean energy that that allows for workforce development and and kind of a robust local supply chain of of people and and where it's possible, you know, goods as well. So um, I, I like that kind of thinking of turning the dial and and that policy design doesn't have to be uh, static. That after it's kind of up and running, you can tweak it and change yeah. it um, yeah. we, once we you've energy, established that trust. Yeah. We, we have an energy poverty plan. And we also have an energy poverty steering group. So then monitor the, the impacts on the ground from a number of stakeholder impacts uh, perspectives. And uh, that's been very useful to turn the dial on design um, because it's not a static thing and it is something that needs those feedback loops to ensure the program is effective and that it's measured. Thank you. And I would just ask the other panelists if they'd like to kind of weigh in on this question of of workforce and thinking about opportunities for working for you know local populations who are also benefiting from some of these policies. Um, if I could add something uh, from our Canadian perspective, one of the key objectives of all our energy efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions reducing programming in the residential sector has also been to grow the retrofit economy uh, and, and then really to send signals to the market, right? Uh, signals that are going to basically nudge the market towards where we wanted to go. Uh, so uh, we have earmarked funding in our programs specifically for things like training uh, because as the technology changes, the workforce needs to adapt. And then, and then, you know, installing a gas furnace, installing a heat pump are completely different things. It's a completely different skill set. So, so if if we don't have the skilled labor uh, to support the programming, that is not going to work. So, 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 so we have considered this. We've also uh, invested in 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 training and upskilling for the workforce that actually doesn't necessarily install the equipment, but does the evaluation, uh, the energy efficiency auditing. Uh, of the residential sector. So they go in people's homes and then do what we call uh, an energy audit. So looking at the energy efficiency of the homes, providing uh, homeowners with education about how the house works uh, as a system and then providing recommendations of what would be effective uh, in terms of retrofitting your home to make it more comfortable, uh, more energy efficient, save, save money, on, on on their heating costs, make them more comfortable and healthy and so on and so forth. So so we've invested in those areas uh, also because without the workforce, these programs don't work. Yeah, completely agree uh, with the other panelists in terms of both the importance of a, a steady flow um, of jobs and also um, comprehensive training for the workforce. I think some of the other things that we've considered um, or some of the challenges that we've faced, I should say, is that you know, oftentimes the workers are not in the same communities where the jobs are. Um, and so a comprehensive community-based approach where residents are helping to improve the, the quality and the efficiency of their own housing is, is you know, one approach to that. Um, another approach to that is to provide the kind of wraparound supports that workers need to be able to access reliable transportation to where the jobs are or where the training programs are. Um, affordable childcare to be able to, you know, access again th those jobs um, and training opportunities. Um, and the last thing I would say about that is that it has to the program has to include a career ladder, right? So energy efficiency jobs in the U.S. are oftentimes you know, very difficult work and and not well paid, not family sustaining jobs. And so how do you sort of create opportunities for workers to come in at an entry level um, in the energy efficiency space, but continue to, as you were saying, um, Jean-Clement, you know, 
receive additional training and move up the career ladder um, and really make those long-term sustainable career opportunities. Yeah, the other thing I might add to that is, I suppose, in Ireland, there's national centers of um, excellence and retrofit that provides free training. Um, and sometimes the challenge can be that we have a supply chain that's very active and may not have the time to invest in, in training. So it's to try and get the balance there. But I think the training providers have been very innovative in having that blend of on-site and uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, building those technologies in to assist in training so that those supply chains can continue to uh, develop and grow and and and, and yet um, increase knowledge and allow them to do, to do the kind of work that needs to be done, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I just want to touch uh, on that. Um, capacity building is key to actually implement any kind of um, energy efficiency or renewable energy program. But uh, the value change that Connor mentioned is really uh, dynamic. No, So you have to be uh, engaging um, the local authorities, but also the end user, the architect, the designer, the, um, the workers that are actually going to be installing and maintaining the technologies. And, and as John said, it, this is uh, always moving and always evolving, and you need to be able to keep them upskilling. And perhaps that, uh, Catherine, could be a solution for this uh, uh, ladder, you know, this career ladder, and then you are uh, going to be also improving your skills as the technologies also evolve. Um, what, what I've noticed uh, in the programs is when, when we targeted houses that were commercially available, the people that were living in houses that had some sustainability or energy efficiency technologies didn't know or didn't quite know that they were living in an eco house. But when the other types of production of, of housing where they are more involved in the decisions uh, uh, were targeted, then it's something like a DIY. You, know? you love them more because you are involved on the solutions and you know that these shading device is providing you comfort and and we see um, a greater engage of the end user with the technology in that way that's a really really good point because i think a lot of this is abstract for people even if it's in their homes i mean just take a heat pump for example if you're at a you know dinner with 15 people and you ask them what a heat pump is you know, you'd be lucky if one or two of them could tell you what it is. I think there is a sort of high barrier, or high bar to to engaging with some of this technology and kind of a hands-on approach when people are able to kind of really think about what it means for their homes. And especially when there's those financial, uh, financial help, whether it's subsidies or incentives so that they're not putting out a, a, an upfront cost that they can't afford. Um, it seems like that would be very important in terms of having some, you know, quote unquote, ownership over uh, these kinds of clean energy technologies and programs. But the program that you're discussing, Liliana, is interesting. I mean, I don't know if there's, I don't know of other examples of programs like that. I, I'd be curious to ask the panelists if they've heard of this, where there's, you know, the people who are going to be moving into these homes or living in these homes you know, really have an active role in in the design of the home kind of at a, at a lower income level. I mean, I know in the United States, we have in certain places, you know, we're trying to put in certain standards around kind of low income houses, housing with, um, you know, certain levels of efficiency, et cetera, but kind of uh, choosing, giving people the option and and helping them through that process seems very interesting in terms of really driving, uh, kind of driving that behavior change. So I'm wondering, do our other panelists, have they heard of like these kinds of programs? I, I suppose related to it, um, Jane, is probably, um, I think the, the, you'll have your mainstream program delivering. And I think uh, in front of that, let's say, call it a working pilot. Uh, sometimes pilots are sort of, um, a working pilot in front that is testing the waters and is, is engaging uh, on particular aspects that you want the program to develop. And so, for example, on the Warmer Homes program, we've two pilots. One is a warmth and well-being pilot, which uh, has been very successful on the health side of, of, of uh, the program. And also we have another pilot, which is looking at the renewables piece and, and developing. But as part of that, we would engage uh, considerably and and the fact that we're driving this ourselves 
uh, with our supply chain, we can engage at the survey stage with regard to suitable measures. So the survey and engagement with the homeowner uh, provides an enormous intelligence with regard to the works and what's suitable for, for the applicant. So while uh, the EPC can provide you with the technical information, it's the engagement at the survey stage and serving the house and having that discussion in, in the home uh, as to what's suitable is, is important um, in line with regulation. Yeah. Did anyone else want to jump in on that? I it's hard to tell if people are unmuting. What Connor just said. I mean, homeowner education and engagement is absolutely key. Uh, homeowners often do not understand how their actual homes work, and 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 and, and um, that makes a huge difference. Uh, we want to empower homeowners to make their own decisions. And for that, they need to be uh, equipped with the proper information and they have and must have the proper understanding. Uh, the Oil to Heat Pump doesn't have this, but our, our, our grant program includes a pre retrofit and a post retrofit evaluation of the home. Uh, a quite comprehensive one, collecting 400 data points. Uh, and and, and a, we empower the user with a full report of the performance of their homes and a list of recommended retrofits when we do the pre-retrofit evaluation and the homeowners decide which ones they want to do uh, because they are the custodians of their financial situation uh, of their family life and whatever they know what is best for them so so we do not tell them which one to do they they select from that list and 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 and, and that's that's that also is important for us to empower uh, our our citizens to make their own decisions. So, so I mean, I thought Liliana's program was 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 incredibly interesting. Um, when we're 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 actually involving citizens in 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 home design and and selecting building materials and so on and so forth. I mean, I'm not quite sure it would work in the Canadian market, but I find this extremely innovative. So, so congratulations on that. No, thank you, Jan. And it's exactly what you just said. I mean, uh, on the previous program for targeting new construction homes, we just um, design the energy packages, you know, the traditional way, simulation, modeling, and 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 we uh, calculated the energy savings and so on. So the, the, the end product, the house, was just delivered uh, to the end user. And in this time, if you are retrofitting, you just you just said that. I mean, the the homeowners they 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 decide uh, what's the best for them, and and because the home is something that is very particular and very um, sensitive for the families, is is not quite a car, no. Because you go to a store and you see a car, and you have two choices: electric or combustion, and you choose uh, uh, within your budget. But your house is you are slowly upgrading it and, and just select the the lighting and the and the curtains and and and, and this you are making it your own and the energy efficiency technology is just another decision about that but the one that you cannot see <laughs> sometimes uh, and, and it's not it doesn't look pretty you know uh, like a, a nice color on your wall so uh, actually informing these decisions is very crucial for implementing uh, renovations and, and, and I'm happy to say that with this Decate Vivienda program, we um, improved the quality of more than 29,500 people. And we intervened around 7,300 homes. And uh, we calculated uh, that we avoid around 9,000 tons of CO2. So this is working with the people no? and, and they are making the decisions. It, it's really inspiring and encouraging that these kinds of programs exist, that there uh, that there's a lot of uptake and that the evaluation that's been done shows that they are effective. And I guess the question is about scaling that. And I'd ask, you know, Liliana and John just to kind of talk a little bit about the plans to scale and, you know, if you think there's you know, challenges there that it's working. I mean, you're obviously reaching a lot of people already, but kind of thinking about these sorts of interventions that do require uh, more upfront costs. And and John, when you talk about the kind of whole home evaluation, I mean, that's, you know, I think that's the gold standard, but that's not, um, 
you know, not a, not a light lift. So just kind of thinking about scaling um, and any thoughts that either of you or our other panelists have on, on kind of scaling some of these successful programs. Um, when you talk about the home evaluation, you're absolutely correct. Um, so this Guide program, which does the home evaluation, has evaluated about 2 million homes. Uh, there are 60 million dwellings in Canada. Uh, it is not realistic uh, to, to expect that our certified evaluators are going to be able to do every house in Canada. Um, we are actually doing a modernization of that program as we speak. Uh, it was designed 20 years ago. It served very various purposes. It's been very successful, but a lot has changed. Digital technology has evolved considerably. Uh, we are looking at a new uh, iteration of that program in which will involve multiple options for homeowners, more elaborate options that are more that are costlier, uh, more involved, that, that they're not as simple, but provide you with much more information. And at the other end of the spectrum, easier, less costly versions that that, that Canadians can also, uh, you know, benefit from because again we need to democratize home labeling energy efficiency labeling we need to democratize this so so that not just to, for individual people's homes but you know we want this data we want this data we want to apply a geospatial lens to this data to inform policy decisions going forward um so so on that in terms of scaling i'm going to be going a bit less positive here uh decarbonizing the residential sector, bringing energy affordability throughout the country is not something that we can subsidize ourselves to. Uh, again, 16 million dwellings. If we wanted to subsidize decarbonization, energy efficiency for $60 million homes, uh, the money doesn't exist for that. So, so, so what we are really doing again, we are nudging the market. We are sending positive signals. We are growing the retrofit economy. We are preparing the table, uh, but 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 we won't be subsidizing every home in Canada. I mean, I don't think there's a national government out there that has this type of money. So 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 we can't subsidize ourselves out of this issue, uh, which which is I mean an unfortunate situation. But we can have a very positive influence, and we can target that influence to those most needs. Yeah, and I just want to underscore your point there because I think using the work that you're doing through subsidization to also send those market signals, that will also help drive down prices in a way that makes them more affordable. And so kind of thinking about the program holistically like that and and what you're able to do in these different stages, I think is really critical to, to the success of our kind of decarbonization goals generally. Um, Liliana, do you want to say something about scaling? And I'm realizing somehow our time is already uh, almost up, but please, uh, please, if there's anything you want to say on that topic. Yes, well, um, what we did um, is, is basically a combination of what Connor and John already said. We we first launched some pilot projects to be tests in the waters on, on how this uh, might work. And uh, then we um, stop, reflect on the, on the findings and with that information, we um, support and advise Mexican government to incorporate all, of, all those lessons in the current um, uh, social uh, um, housing programs. So as for now, uh, we know that the, um, one of these uh, programs uh, that are currently working in the north of the country, which is very hot and, and, and air conditioning is, um, is, is, is the most, uh, they are planning on uh, rehabilitating around 2,000 homes yearly so i know we have like 35 million homes in mexico so 2000 doesn't seem like much uh, but <laughs> exactly and i see john is, is, is laughing it's not nearly the millions that you just mentioned but uh, it's, it's something that we are starting on uh, with this uh, new uh, tool also the digital tool that we launch where uh, as, as john said uh, the end user is going to be choosing uh, the technologies and, and they are coupling it with the financing. So how much can I pay? And they select the technologies and they are uh, basically running the program like that. And we'll also link uh, this program uh, there. Great, thank you for that. Did, did I hear someone trying to jump in there? 
I know we're, we're just really short on time, but, and there's so much okay. to say here, but I just wanted to throw in, uh, um, you know, the fact that as policymakers, we have both sort of carrots and sticks at our disposal. And so I do think part of the key to scalability, right, is to require or, or um, leverage private investment in the market by increasing the kinds of standards that we are requiring buildings to meet um, and sort of disincentivizing, you know, new investment in, in fossil fuel technologies and buildings. So I think that has to go hand in hand with some of the catalytic sort of market transformation work that we're doing as well. I'd agree with Catherine. Uh, so the only other point I'd add is the value proposition. So I know the International Energy Agency published a, a paper some some years ago on multiple benefits, um, and uh, I think um, improving the information and that and presenting that back to the um, to, to to the uh, population is important as well because why people may invest in this it could be for various reasons and health may be one of them comfort so it's not sometimes it's not quite what we see and. Uh, so I think to be able to present that data, um, people will invest on, on on a range of drivers. Connor, that's a that's a great point for us to to end on here. Um, as I sort of alluded to at the beginning, this is really work. I mean, obviously, IEA has done a lot of work on multiple benefits. Um, this is work that we're really thinking about. Um, kind of multiple benefits of other kinds of clean energy technologies, and um, and really making the case that that this is not just about emissions reductions, this is about health, it's about comfort, it's about you know growing the economy. Um, and it's it's really important that we find the right ways to, to communicate that and that we have the policy successes also to really support, support that. Um, and personally, I feel better after the last hour and 15 minutes with the four of you, um, just because of all the incredible work that you're doing. Um, and, and I think this kind of wide ranging conversation really goes to show that there is this, um, it is very cross cutting and it is very important for us to be thinking about all of these different pieces. And, you know, I think everyone on, on this panel is really thinking about the clean energy transition in this way and kind of particularly in regards to targeting programs for low income households, really kind of thinking about all of the, the different kind of policy implications of that and, and how, to, how to have the outcomes that will be most beneficial for, for those populations. Um, so I want to thank all of you for for taking your time. This was a really great conversation. I think we could have gone on for for another hour, um, but uh, but I will give the rest of give you the rest of your day back. Um, and thank you. And and for those who are participating and, and listening online, thank you so much. Um, again, if you have kind of thoughts or ideas about this, you know, please do not hesitate to reach out. This is a really important area for us and. Um, if you have particularly some some data or some case studies that kind of talk about this multiple benefits um, work, we'd be very curious to to hear it and to engage on that with you. So thank you very much, everyone.